Sega's final console was not the Dreamcast. That thing was dead for four years and Sega just up and went, you know what, let's teach some Japanese kids math. This is the advanced Pico Bina from Sega, specifically Sega's toy divisions, the, the, the people who would later make the Wappy Dog. Granted, this wasn't the first time they did something like this. There was the original Sega Pico, which came out in 1993, and unlike the APB here, it actually got a North American release. And I did a video on it about a year and some back, go check it out. That system also had some Pokemon games for it, only in Japan albeit, which made it one of two different Sega consoles to ever have Pokemon releases for them. The other of course is the Bina here, and it just so happens that that's the subject of today's video. This is Stuff We Play, home of everything weird and retro, and today's video certainly fits that bill as this is Advanced Pico Bina, Sega's true final game console. But first, before we get into our main course today, I'd like to mention today's sponsor. This video today is brought to you in part by PCBWay.com. Take advantage of services from 3D printing to CNCing to, of course, PCB design and printing. From small orders to massive batches of PCBs, they have you covered, no matter the project. This includes a variety of PCB designs from the ever-growing PCBWay community. Custom Game Boy cartridge boards, controller adapters for a variety of retro computers, and even stuff for your model train enthusiasts out there. It really is just proof that they have something for everyone. Check out PCBWay.com using the link in the description below and let them power up your next maker project today. And with that, let's get back to your regularly scheduled content. Isn't it beautiful? It's like a big plasticky pastel uh, laptop. And it's leaps and bounds thinner than the original Pico as well. Which, I mean, makes sense. That thing came out a whole 12 years before this thing. Full disclosure, by the way, though they aren't sponsoring this video, this Bina was sent to me by Zen Market. They actually sponsored a video I did in the Nintendo Famicom last year, and are all around good folks you should check out if you want to import some Japanese video game stuff of your own. Or, you know, be like my friend Jazzy, and use them to get yourself some Warhammer figures. My Bina may also be a little bit thinner than most models too. Research suggests that this may in fact be a Bina Lite, which was a somewhat slimmer remodel from 2008. That's the year after the Dreamcast had its final official release in Japan, by the way. Oh yeah, fun fact, everyone thinks this thing died in 2001, but it was getting official games all the way until 07. So back to the Bina. What's gaming on this system like? Well first off, due to not having the thick, bulgy base of the original Pico, it just has a kickstand. Predating the Nintendo Switch by nearly 12 years too, how forward thinking. This can of beans is easy to lug around as well. It has a physical handle on it and just feels really sturdy, but also really lightweight, which I'm sure is a winning combo for a system aimed at that ever hard to please under 5 crowd. What's sure not a win though, is the cable situation. Okay, actually not the power cable. I mean, it's a pretty standard barrel plug, I guess. Are y'all really interested in knowing about the power cable? Anyways, did you know that some Bina models can be run off of batteries? Neat! But I'm really not a fan of how the AV cables are here. These are composite cables, and they are your only video output option here. Even by the mid 2000s, the old red, yellow, and white composite cables felt a little dated. And even though Bina lights are made into the 2010s, it doesn't matter. I couldn't find any component or HDMI solutions, official or otherwise, and as far as I can tell, these cables are proprietary, which is always a big damn annoyance. It's not all bad though. In August 2005, when the original Bina launched, the major big kid systems were the PlayStation 2, GameCube, and original Xbox. And two of those mostly relied on proprietary memory cards for saving game data. And while a lot of Bina titles were so simple that they had no need for saving other things, maybe than just virtual coloring book art or high scores, Sega had the foresight to give this thing SD card support. Sure, it's only a 32-bit machine running off a very common ARM processor of the time. It honestly feels even less powerful than the PlayStation 1 was. And you probably won't find a single polygon in any of the games on here. But what else would you expect for a game console that costs 12,800 yen new? 
Let's do a quick comparison. The Sony PSP was a full-fledged handheld released the same year as the Bina, and it was about on par power-wise with the PS2. But also, it cost a whopping 250 bucks at launch in the States. The Bina costs the equivalent of just over $100 on the other hand, and though not as powerful, it could probably survive a toddler or my husband spilling a drink or two on it. The overall user experience here is just an evolution of the original Pico, and that's all it needs to be. Games come on cartridges that take a storybook format, with flippable plastic pages that you can interact with using a touch pen. In America and the original Pico, these were called Storyware, though I'm unsure if such a name was ever used in Japan. Cartridges also physically lock into place, really securely at that mean that you don't have to worry about anything coming loose if you have to lug this big beanie boy around. Below the cartridge slot half is the power button and a rather sturdy feeling hinge. And then below that is your main control station. There's a glorified mouse pad in the center that lets you drag the touchpad around like, well, a mouse. And that's like in the original Pico. Also like with the original Pico, to select anything in game with the pen, you literally just press down with it. When you do that, the tip will click in. It's a nice middle ground between, say, a DS stylus and a standard computer mouse. There's also two different pen slots, and if you want you can use a Phillips head screwdriver to unscrew the pen and swap it over to the other side. It's not meant for any multiplayer stuff so much as Sega just went out of their way to make the system accessible to both left and right handed kids, hence the two pen slots and two sets of buttons. Admittedly, like the original Pico, these buttons are the weakest aspect. They do feel better than on the original, I'll give them that, but there's still a degree of, I guess, mushiness? I'm glad most games only require you to use the pen or the physical controls, and never really both, because having the main action button right over what's supposed to be a D-pad is just not a great layout. Or it would be if this was a traditional game console. You aren't going on grand adventures to save the world in your average Bina game. Instead, you're learning to write in Japanese or do simple math or just trying to figure out that dang object permanence thing. And we can see this in all two of the games in my Bina collection. So to start, let's look at the one that was shoved inside my system when it arrived in the mail, Onpon Man. Who is Anpan Man? Well, he's the superhero star of a long-running series of Japanese children's books by Takashi Yanase. His head is an actual Anpan, which is a red bean sweet roll snack. And he was hugely popular. There have been Anpan Man toys, clothes, snack foods, anime series, trains, and of course, video games. Now, I don't read or speak Japanese, so I don't know exactly what this game is titled, and that's perhaps problematic as there's a truly wild number of Anpan Man games for the Bina alone. But this is the one I have, and it's basically a Where's Waldo book with WarioWare elements. What's really cool about Bina games is to get off the title screen, you literally have to flip a page. And from there, the game will tell you to just spot certain characters in the collages on whatever page you're on. And you just click on them using the touch pen, right there, on the book page, with the pen. No joke, it's that easy and intuitive. But there's also a variety of mini games that you can just also select off the page, ranging from burger flipping to way basic puzzles to, my favorite, cleaning a hippo's teeth. The best addition though is that every Bina game seems to have some sort of coloring program built into it. The one in Anpan Man is definitely up there too, as far as virtual coloring books go, I guess. There are some preset outlines to color and even just a blank page for you to doodle stuff on. If I had this when I was a kid, I would have gone absolutely wild. Hell, even as an adult, my husband and I had a blast here. Take a look at this kitty they drew, and uh, also this rocket ship that I drew. But yeah, that's Anpan Man, or one of them anyway. Let's move on over to the other game I have and hope we don't get copyright claimed for talking about the Pokemon anime. It's so weird seeing something licensed by Nintendo and Game Freak and also, well, Sega. This game is Pokemon Advanced Generation Pokemon Number Battle. It's the first of four Pokemon games on the Bina and was perceived by three on the original Pico. It's kind of crazy to see how far throughout the Pokemon timeline these stretch. The three games in the original Pico cover Pokemon Generations 2 and 3, this one on the Bina is also from Gen 3, and then it was followed by two games from Gen 4 and one from Gen 5. 
And for those not versed in Pokemon Generations, this is a subseries of seven games released only between 2002 and 2010. That's roughly a game a year for eight years. And like all of those other games too, this one is based specifically on the Pokemon anime. It's the Ruby and Sapphire arc here, or Pokemon Advance as it was called in the West. This one is a math game. Chat with Ash and friends, engage in some Team Rocket themed minigames, and click around like it's an old humongous point and click adventure to maybe even catch some Mons. Is it just me though, or does it look like a lot of these sprites were ripped straight out of one of the Game Boy Advance Pokemon games? Maybe Fire Red and Leaf Green? The aim here is just to teach simple math. Like really simple math. As in there's a bird racing game where you get speed boosts just by choosing which of two numbers is bigger. Pokemon Diamond and Pearl released a year after this and tasked you with saving the universe. Pokemon Number Battle tasked you with learning what the number 4 is. I mean I kind of get it. This is literally baby's first Pokemon game and that's not some sort of low hanging joke. That's literally the intent here. Goodness, I was playing this on a pastel pink and yellow chew proof laptop. And there's also some cool extras, yeah! You can go visit Professor Oak's lab to, I guess, get some info on the Pokemon you've seen throughout the game? I don't know, I still don't understand Japanese. Oh, and uh, there's a calculator, though it's weirdly limited. Why is the game only allowing me to play around with two digit numbers? It very clearly can display numbers with three or more digits. Were the devs afraid of a kid typing out 80085? Cause that shit's on them. At least the coloring program is pretty decent, but not as good as an Onpon Man though. This is going to sound like an odd critique, but hear me out. In Onpon Man, the colors were in the physical book. You could physically tap on them, and that was that. Pokemon Number Battle though perhaps gives you more colors to play around with, but you have to clumsily scroll through the colors on screen and select them using the touchpad. And it's fully playable still. I really like the pre-made color sheets here too, with this one of plus one minum especially being adorable and just speaking to me. But it just feels like it'd be so much more. I mean, it's from the Pokemon series after all. Goodness. Why are there only 10 or so Pokemon color pages to choose from? Why is there no undo button? Why do I have to hold down the paint fill to make it fill up the whole screen? Oh, well, actually, on second thought, that's kind of a cool effect. Damn it, look! It's a Pokemon number learning game made for a toddler's game system that only came out in Japan. I can't be too critical. But on that same note, Onpun Man just had so much more charm to it to me. Like, am I learning anything by cooking up an anime burger patty? No, but it's fun and mixes in well with the actual edutainment-esque stuff. As for Pokemon here, but just look at it. Even as a Pokemon fan, most of what I feel by looking at this is just a sense of, yup, that's edutainment. And yet I'm still weirdly glad to own it. I mean, as far as my game collection goes, it's certainly a conversation piece. I just gotta see if I can track down the Pokemon black and white tie-in game for the Bina. I mean, can I really resist a name like Intelligence Training Pokemon Big Sports Meet? So that's it for the Advanced Pico Bina, Sega's true final console. And for sure, I like the Dreamcast more, but I'm not exactly the target demographic of the APB, am I? When I was a little kid though, if I had gotten one of these things, I'd be more than happy just screwing around with the virtual coloring pages. I love how much of an oddity the Bina is in the grand scheme of gaming history too. It seems like a glorified, Sega-fied leapster, and yet its library is filled with big name Japanese licenses. And sure, it hasn't seen a new game since 2011, but much like the Sega Master System in Brazil, it has never been formally discontinued. Think about that. Not only did Sega release a game console after the Dreamcast, but it's also one that still technically gets some sort of support for it. And that's just wild to me. And while there is more I could talk about with the Bina, than the fact it had zero Sonic games for it, the fact it had its own mascot, the fact it had an accessory that was literally a full on play kitchen, well, perhaps those are better left for more informal videos which uh, I recently tried a bit on here, but I mostly just do them over on my TikTok channel, which is linked in the description. I'm um, Jamie Plays stuff on there, and it's been way chill so far. The big vibe I want on YouTube this year is not just to cover weird hardware and weird documentary-worthy stories from throughout gaming history, but to full-on celebrate them. 
And if that sounds cool to you, then maybe subscribe and maybe even support me by becoming a channel member or a Patreon supporter for as low as a dollar a month. And even get access to some exclusive content, some early content, and of course get your name featured at the end of my videos with these fine folks right here. If you have any questions about the Bina or the Pika or anything I've talked about today, of course feel free to let me know in the comments below too. So on that note, thank you very much for watching, stay classy, and I'll see you next time.